Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. We have another great Grand Rounds today, which is a continuation of our focus on child health equity. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Tara Valcarell, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Um, our first speaker is nurse practitioner Meredith Russell. She is nursing director of the multidisciplinary UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center, where she is dedicated to delivering high quality healthcare services for tran transgender, gender diverse youth. After joining UCSF Pediatric Endocrinology in 2011, she helped launch the UCSF CAGC clinic in 2012 with a team of medical, mental health, social work, and education professionals. She also cares for pediatric patients with endocrine disorders and is interested in the use of health information technology to improve the quality, safety, and cost of healthcare. Russell's passion for caring for gender diverse youth was sparked by families seeking comprehensive gender affirming services and through her work with CAGC colleagues. She contributes to the impact of early medical treatment in transgender youth, a multi-center study sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. She has published papers on the care of gender diverse youth in scholarly journals, such as the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. Russell earned her Master of Science in Nursing degree from UCSF School of Nursing and is an active member of World Professional Association for Transgender Health and Pediatric Endocrine Society. Grateful to participate in the gender health team, Russell is an ardent outdoor enthusiast. And our second speaker, Janet Lee. Janet Lee is an assistant professor of pediatrics and of medicine in the divisions of pediatric endocrinology and of endocrinology and metabolism at the University of California, San Francisco. A pediatric and adult endocrinologist, Dr. Lee provides gender affirming medical therapy to TGD youth and adults with strong interests in increasing access to care, as well as conducting and supporting high quality research in transgender health. Dr. Lee's primary research focuses on understanding the skeletal effects of gender affirming medical therapy in transgender and gender diverse youth. And I'll now pass it off to our speakers. Thank you so much, Tara, um, and welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us to discuss increasing access to care for transgender youth using telehealth. It's a privilege to work as part of a team here at UCSF to provide support and quality gender affirming health care for gender diverse youth and their families. I have learned a great deal over the years from emerging research from my colleagues here at UCSF and probably most importantly from our patients and families. In fact, it was patience that it led me to telehealth. Um, thanks, Tara, for introducing us. Um, it's been a real pleasure to partner with Meredith on this important quality improvement project, and we are really excited to share with you our experience with telehealth at the UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center. We hope that our findings will help all of you think about how to integrate telehealth going forward to increase access to care for your patients. We have no relevant fin financial or regulatory disclosures, but I have served on advisory boards for Ultragenics Pharmaceuticals. And all of the gender affirming medications that we are going to discuss today uh, are used off label and are not FDA approved for the listed diagnoses here. Our objectives today are to identify health disparities and barriers to care that transgender and gender diverse youth face in accessing gender affirming medical therapy. We'll describe the history of telehealth and how telehealth was implemented at the UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center to increase access to care while maintaining high patient satisfaction and excellent communication and privacy. Finally, we'll review the factors that impact the future of telehealth in the post-pandemic era and encourage you to apply these concepts to your own practice setting as we work together as an organization to utilize technology to improve healthcare. So it's helpful to have a shared terminology during this presentation. These terms may not reflect an individual's gender experience 
and providers should ask patients what words they prefer to describe their identity or gender experience. However, during this presentation, the terms transgender and gender diverse are used to describe a gender identity that is different than designated sex at birth. In contrast, cisgender is a gender identity that's congruent with designated sex. Gender non-binary is a gender identity that's not exclusively male or female. And gender dysphoria is the distress experienced when a gender identity is incongruent with designated sex. Now, please keep in mind that not all transgender youth experience gender dysphoria, but that those that do may seek med medical treatments, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Let's focus on the population we're discussing today. According to a large national survey, approximately 0.7% of youth aged 13 to 17 years and 0.6% of adults in the United States identify as transgender. More recent surveys suggest that up to 3.2% of adolescents in the United States identify as transgender. These data don't include youth younger than 13 years old, but it's clear that there's a substantial number of TGD youth in the United States, and based on our referral volumes, it's a steadily growing population. UCSF's Center of Excellence for Transgender Health was founded back in 2009 with a mission to increase access to comprehensive, effective, and affirming healthcare services for all transgender and gender diverse communities. Together with communities, as well as a national advisory board of transgender leaders, the center delivers clinical practice guidelines and quality research in transgender health. The center includes a multidisciplinary collaboration between primary care services, mental health, reproductive health, surgery, voice and speech therapy, advocacy, and endocrine services for both adult and pediatric patient populations. Housed within the Center of Excellence is our Pediatric Child and Adolescent Gender Center Clinic. We provide interdisciplinary healthcare with medical, psychological, social work, and nursing services. The clinic link also has links to community organizations such as Mind the Gap, which is a consortium of mental health gender specialists or therapists in the community setting, Gender Spectrum, which provides training and advocacy in schools and organizations that serve youth, and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, or NCLR, which is a legal organization that promotes the civil and human rights of all LGBT individuals. We work together to provide wraparound care for gender diverse youth and their family. We practice under the gender affirmative model of care, which is the process of affirming an individual's gender identity across all four domains, including the social, psychological, medical, and legal domains. This includes validating a person's experienced gender, supporting their mental health and medical needs, and advocating for legal and policy changes that enable transgender youth to thrive. We also align with official clinical practice guidelines from the Endocrine Society, World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and the UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. These guidelines, which have contributions from our own UCSF experts, are available online and include recommendations for both adult and pediatric populations. The treatment approach to gender dysphoria depends on age and pubertal stage. A mental health gender specialist can be helpful throughout the lifespan. And prior to puberty, non-medical interventions such as family support, social transition, and school resources are important in our gender affirmative model. At the start of puberty, youth then become eligible to start pubertal suppression with gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists, either through depo injection or implant. For trans feminine individuals starting gender affirming care in later puberty, spironolactone can also be used for androgen blocking. Gender affirming sex hormones in the form of testosterone, either topically injectable or pellet, or estradiol, again topically oral or injectable, are then introduced in mid to late puberty with gender affirming surgeries and fertility preservation as additional important considerations. 
In addition to aligning with clinical practice guidelines to ensure that each youth is eligible for gender-affirming medical therapy with puberty blockers and or gender-affirming sex hormones based on pubertal status and age, we partner with our qualified mental health colleagues in the community to ensure that a gender evaluation has been complete and that no interfering mental health pro uh, problems are present. The legal guardians and youth then engage in informed consent and assent with the prescribing provider in which the potential risks and benefits are discussed. Finally, once gender affirming medical therapy has been initiated, we strive for ongoing team based care with follow up visits every six every three to six months as recommended by clinical practice guidelines. So why is it important to talk about increasing access to gender affirming services? Well, we know that transgender youth experience disparities compared to their cisgender peers. Few large scale assessments of these disparities exist among teens. However, in 2017, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in 10 states and nine large urban school districts, including San Francisco, piloted a question about transgender identity and collected data on transgender and cisgender high school students. Results show that nearly 2% of high school students identify as transgender, and unfortunately, they had higher rates of violence victimization, substance use, and suicide risk compared to cisgender peers. You can see here detailed results from that survey. In the right column, you can see the transgender youth experience higher rates of being bullied, using alcohol, considering or attempting suicide, having young age sexual intercourse, and having unprotected sex compared to their cisgender peers. I wanna highlight um, something that's particularly concerning, which is the higher rate of attempted suicide, which you can see here is 35% for transgender youth. This is comparison to 5.5% and 9.1% for cis males and females respectively. This study highlights the mental health disparities between transgender and cisgender youth in Boston, Massachusetts. The ret this retrospective cohort study of medical record data of 180 transgender and 180 cisgender youth resulted in a two to four times increased risk of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation or attempt, and mental health service utilization for transgender youth when compared to their cisgender peers. We know that minority stress, as well as a lack of access to gender affirming health care, both worsen health disparities for transgender people. Analysis of a large 2015 US transgender survey of 20,000 adults resulted in only 49% of those who wanted hormone therapy, such as estrogen or testosterone, actually received it, and only 2.5% of those who wanted puberty blockers in youth received it and lack of access to puberty blockers was associated with an increased risk of suicidality. Now, there are several barriers to care, including fear of stigmatization by healthcare providers, as well as legal or financial restrictions. However, a 2016 survey of transgender youth and their caregivers resulted in the main barrier being a lack of qualified providers in their community who could provide quality gender affirming health care. And while health disparities clearly exist, several factors improve health and function. In addition to increasing access to gender affirming health care services, uh, strong parental support for a youth gender identity by, and enabling social transition to their experienced gender at school and in the community can both improve health and function. These are all things we do um, to support in our clinic and we want to uh, build resilience in our youth population. There is, there is evidence that increasing access to gender affirming care improves outcomes. For example, this longitudinal Dutch study of 22 trans females and 33 trans males who received puberty blockers, followed by cross-sex hormones, estrogen or testosterone, and then later genital surgery in young adulthood, resulted in improved gender dysphoria, well-being, and function at the end of the study.
Now, at its core, this presentation is about quality improvement for an at-risk patient population, as well as health equity. The national push for QI was sparked by both skyrocketing healthcare costs and the Institute of Medicine classic 1999 landmark study to Air as Human, which highlighted the high number of healthcare errors that harm patients. In response, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement created the triple aim, which you can see here in the triangle shape, which is a framework for improving healthcare through policy to improve population health and patient experience, all while reducing costs. Now later, a fourth or quadruple aim was added to improve provider experience. Where does telehealth fit in with QI? Well, telehealth improves health outcomes, improves patient and provider satisfaction, and has the opportunity to reduce cost. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a national call by Healthy People 2020, as well as the Affordable Care Act, to increase the meaningful use of telehealth or telemedicine to improve access to healthcare services, healthcare overall, and population health. Now, there are multiple definitions of telehealth and telemedicine. Telemedicine is the delivery of healthcare services where patients and providers are separated by a distance. It includes synchronous or real-time video conferencing, such as Zoom, that we, we know all about, as well as asynchronous store-forward applications, such as reviewing x-rays transmitted from one location to another, and remote patient monitoring, such as monitoring a patient's blood pressure at home. Telehealth is a broader term referring to the use of information and communication technology to exchange information for diagnosis and treatment, but also for research and evaluation and for the continuing education of healthcare professionals. In this presentation, telehealth and telemedicine will be used interchangeably, and telehealth is particularly important for vulnerable groups such as transgender youth. It's helpful to know a little bit about where we came from to understand where we are today. So the practice of medical care at a distance dates back to the Middle Ages, when many European physicians rece received stories of patient illnesses by letters, often accompanied by a flask of urine for diagnostic testing, and they prescribed treatments without face-to-face -face interaction. The first reports of telehealth technology, however, began during the Civil War, when the telegraph was used to transmit communications about casualty lists and medical orders from the battlefield to military bases. The beginning of what we now know as telemedicine began with a rhesus monkey at NASA. Before astronauts were sent to space, NASA wanted to know whether the human body could function in space. So in the 1950s, the US and Soviets sent animals such as rhesus monkeys and then later dogs into space in rockets and then transmitted back biometric data using telemetry back to scientists on Earth. NASA, NASA later applied this technology to the monitoring of healthcare of astronauts. The introduction of closed circuit cable television in the 1950s was then applied to telemedicine. In 1955, a closed circuit television link between Nebraska Psychiatric Institute and the Norfolk State Mental Hospital 112 miles away was used to conduct inpatient psychiatric groups and virtual, virtual neuro, neurological exams. Later in the 1970s, NASA brought telemedicine technology to Earth. In order to increase medical care access for people living in remote loca locations of Arizona, such as the Papago Indian Reservation, they use two-way microwave transmissions to link personnel and medical vans and fixed stations with specialists in hospitals in Tucson and Phoenix. You can see here in the middle of the slide a picture of one of those mobile units. Widespread use of video conferencing began with the computer revolution in the 1980s. Mobile phones helped fuel the popularity of video conferencing and businesses began to adopt video conferencing in 2004 when broadband technology became widespread and affordable. However, there was limited uptake of, tele of telemedicine in the healthcare industry, with only 2.4% of enrollees in large employer health plans using telehealth back in 2018. However, as you know, the year 2020 saw a dramatic increase in the use of telehealth due to, due to the pandemic. There is a complex web of federal and state telemedicine laws and regulations that determine 
who can deliver which telemedicine services to whom, in which location, in what fashion, and how they will be reimbursed. The federal government regulates reimbursement and coverage of telemedicine for Medicare and self-insured plans, while Medicaid and fully insured private plans are largely regulated on a state-to-state -state basis. This complexity in the regulatory framework for telemedicine creates many challenges when developing a QI project like, like ours. You can see here how both federal and state regulations impact how you can deliver healthcare. Privacy, patient consent, provider licensing, prescribing, and reimbursement are all heavily regulated. UCSF complies with HIPAA privacy through a business associate agreement with HIPAA compliant Zoom. Prior to the pandemic, my patients had to have an in-person exam before I could prescribe a controlled substance such as testosterone, and they had to be located in the state of California where I'm licensed. However, due to the, due to the pandemic um, and the, the national emergency, um, this has broadened the waiver authority under the section 1135 of the Social Security Act, which has temporarily lifted telehealth restrictions. Some states and some insurance carriers also have temporarily lifted restrictions. For example, as you may have experienced yourself, patients can now conduct telehealth from home, clinicians can practice across state lines, they can prescribe controlled substances without an in-person exam, and they can receive equal reimbursement compared to in-person care. A little background for our project. The UCSF Gender Center began in 2012 at the Mission Bay campus in San Francisco. UCSF Health as an institution implemented telehealth back in 2015, and the UCSF Telehealth Resource Center enables outpatient video visits, online remote second opinions, internal inpatient consults, as well as outside facility consults with patients in conjunction with their local care team. I became an early adopter of telehealth in 2016 when I started a pediatric endocrinology feasibility telehealth clinic. This was back when we used WebEx and I conducted visits from a clinic exam rooms. <laughs> Feedback from patients was very positive and I found that patients who successfully completed one video visit were likely to schedule more in the future. As the gender clinic grew exponentially, we found that the vast majority of patients lived outside of San Francisco, indicating a real geographic barrier to care. So the local context for this project is a team-based in-person clinic visit model in which increasing access to care was accomplished by expanding in-person clinics from San Francisco over to Oakland and San Mateo, and then finally San Ramon. At each site, we have a team of medical, mental health, nursing, and social work providers who collaborate to provide quality, comprehensive care. The purpose of this telehealth quality improvement project was to offer video visits as an option for follow-up to transgender, gender diverse youth aged eight to 25 years who reside in California and are pursuing gender affirming medications such as puberty blockers, estrogen, testosterone, with the overall goal to increase convenience of follow up and reduce hours missed from other activities such as school or work um, compared to clinic visits while maintaining a high patient satisfaction. During the project, we used the evidence-based practice Iowa model in order to guide our project. Finding a solution to the healthcare access problem for transgender youth is a UCSF priority because it is in line with our mission to provide excellent patient care, social justice, and health equity. So we formed a QI team, conducted a thorough literature search on telehealth evidence, designed a pilot project, implemented that project, and then evaluated the results. And here we are today to talk about that. We found a wide body of literature demonstrating that telemedicine results in effective and a satisfactory care for adult and pediatric patient populations. You can see here on the left that a 2015 Cochrane review of 93 studies examining the effectiveness of telehealth compared to in-person care in adult and pediatric patients with a wide range of medical and psychiatric conditions resulted in that evidence that telemedicine was equally or even in some cases more effective than in-person care and improved well-being. Since then, numerous studies in pediatric patients with diabetes, 
obesity, asthma, psychiatric conditions like depression or anxiety have shown that telemedicine is effective and satisfactory. While there is limited evidence of the use of telehealth for transgender youth, a, a pretty large survey of U, US transgender youth found that the majority were interested in using telemedicine for routine follow-up care, such as medication refills and going over lab results with their provider. This is an overview of the QI project timeline, which as you can see, predated the pandemic by over a year. An informal needs assessment began in 2019 in which Meredith interviewed both parent, patients and caregivers about their experience attending regular follow-up visits in clinic, and also interviewed medical providers about their experience with no-show visits, gaps in follow-up, and challenges with prescribing and monitoring gender-affirming medical therapy. Several themes emerged and informed the next steps of the QI project. Patients and caregivers cited travel distance or time as significant barriers to follow-up and expressed frustration about how this interfered with their ability to get medication prescriptions and to discuss care with their providers. Additionally, missing school and work decreased quality of life and commuting, commuting to clinic was costly. On the other hand, providers expressed concern about gaps in care due to lack of follow-up and the impact on quality of care for patients. In order to further evaluate the barriers to care and possible solutions, a formal needs assessment was then conducted using anonymous red cap electronic and paper surveys, which were distributed in clinic to caregivers or patients 18 years and older. Telehealth video visits were then implemented uh, in March 2020 and a hybrid clinic vi video visit model was later implemented a month later. Evaluation of the QI project occurred over one month starting in September of 2020 with an anonymous red cap electronic survey that was distributed after patients completed a video and clinic visit to compare outcomes. Sixty-nine caregivers and young adult pa patients completed the formal needs assessment. The participants identified travel distance or time needed to get to clinic and inability to take time off work or school as major barriers to regular follow-up every three to six months. Potential solutions to such barriers suggested by participants included video visits, more appointment availability, and financial assistance with the cost of travel or parking. While the overall satisfaction with care from the UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center was positive, it was clear that geography was a major barrier to attending regular clinic follow-up. With these results in mind, the QI team then developed a project evaluation survey. While it was clear there was a patient demand for video visits, our medical and mental health providers were unsure whether the care delivered by telehealth would be as effective as in-person clinical care. Therefore, it was important to our CAGC team to thoroughly evaluate these questions. The three major domains examined were communication quality and privacy, access to care, and quality of services in order to answer the question, will expanding video visits for follow-up of transgender youth pursuing gender-affirming medications increase access to care while maintaining excellent communication and privacy, as well as overall patient satisfaction. Responses were re-rated using Likert scales with one representing strongly agree and five representing strongly disagree. One question regarding estimated travel time spent to attend the visit provided choices in which one represented less time and four represented more time. The survey was to be distributed to caregivers of pediatric patients and to young adult patients after completing both clinic and video visits. Given the strong evidence to, to, to support telehealth, we prepared to initiate this project in early 2020. The original plan was to distribute the electronic survey in real time after patients completed an in-person clinic visit and then again after they completed a follow-up video visit several months later. The responses would be compared to determine if there were significant differences in those three domains of communication quality and privacy, access to care, and quality of services. However, before we implemented the project, a coronavirus disrupted the plan and we rapidly modified the project design and began implementation. So 
So starting in March of 2020, we implemented video visits for all CAGC patients, followed by uh, offering a hybrid clinic video visit program. Participants recruited uh, were from our CAGC San Francisco site and included legal guardians of pediatric patients and young adult patients who resided in California, identified as transgender or gender diverse, were pursuing gender affirming medications and spoke English or Spanish. Participants were included in the telehealth intervention if they did not need an in-person visit and were included in the survey distribution if they had completed at least one clinic visit and one video visit. The QI project was approved by the UCSF Human Research Protection Program Institutional Review Board as an exempt study. Due to the change imposed by the pandemic, we, distribute the, we distributed the electronic surveys during the month of September to October to patients after they completed a, a follow-up visit, either video or clinic. Patients were then asked to recall their experience with video and clinic visits when answering the questions. Here are the survey results comparing the clinic and video visits using the Wilcoxon signed rank test. There were no statistically significant differences between clinic and video visits in the communication quality and privacy domains, and no statistically significant differences in overall satisfaction with the quality of services between both visit types. However, in the access to care domain, we saw that patients more strongly agreed that video visits were a more convenient form of healthcare delivery. They also more strongly agreed that clinic visits took too much time away from other activities when compared to video visits. Finally, video visits took less time to complete than clinic visits. In summary, all three statements in the access to care domain showed statistically significant differences favoring video visits over clinic visits. Unexpectedly to us, the survey also uh, showed that respondents rated video visits as a slightly more acceptable way to receive healthcare services than clinic visits, and that they were slightly more likely to schedule video visit service, uh, video visit uh, in the future than clinic visit. A closer look at the, the communication and quality metrics show that an overwhelming majority of survey respondents felt equally positive about the following statements, that they could easily talk to the healthcare provider during the visit, that their privacy was protected, protected during the visit, that they were able to understand the provider's recommendations, and that they were overall satisfied with the quality of service um, being provided by the visit. This was an important metric for us. So the results of this telehealth QI project uh, demonstrated that patients who participated in telehealth agreed that clinic and video visits provided equally excellent communication quality privacy and over overall satisfaction with healthcare services. However, patients did report that video visits were more convenient, took less time away from other activities such as school or work, and required less travel time when compared to clinic visits. In addition, patients were more likely to agree that video visits were an acceptable way to receive healthcare and were more likely to choose video visits again in the future. As a result, we met our project goals in increasing access to gender affirming healthcare for TGD youth by utilizing video visits while providing communication quality, privacy, and satisfaction commensurate to clinic visits. There were multiple strengths to this QI project, including the extensive planning with informal and formal needs assessments that were done prior to the pandemic, accelerating the implement, implementation timeline of this study. Our data will add to the growing body of evidence demonstrating that telehealth is effective, satisfactory, and feasible. The telehealth QI project also met the goals, um, as stated before, of increasing access while uh, maintaining quality. Most importantly, we in included the perspectives of our patients and their caregivers and had an excellent survey response rate of 85%. However, there are some limitations to our QI project that will help guide our future directions. 
These include that this was a small pilot project that utilized the convenience sample. Additionally, the survey was limited to nine close-ended questions with no collection of demographic data. Because of this, we may be missing perspectives of those who can't access telehealth. Finally, this was a cross-sectional assessment and we lack longitudinal data evaluating attitude changes over time. So now that the pilot project is complete, and as Dr. Lee was mentioning, the results have demonstrated success, uh, a hybrid clinic video visit model will be implemented long-term at our gender clinic sites in order to increase access to care while maintaining quality and satisfaction. We envision a service model in which new patients or those who would benefit from an in-person evaluation would be seen in clinic while those appropriate for video visits based on provider assessment would be offered telehealth. So we do, we do see this as a complementary model. So we don't think that video visits can replace in-person care, but we could have a hybrid model that where it works well together in order to increase access. This is anticipated to solve the problem of, the, of geographic barriers to care for our population and possibly it could reduce health disparities experienced by transgender youth because of a lack of, of care. In order to support the hybrid clinic telehealth model, we plan to develop gender clinic telehealth practice guidelines that outline best practices for video visits. This will address special considerations such as the evaluation of puberty, the evaluation of growth, and access to adequate broadband. So currently we do have a pediatric medical specialties guideline for home telehealth. Um, that it probably does need some updates, um, but it does offer some, some guidance to providers who wish to conduct video visits. Um, however, in our patient population, it's particularly important that we have, a pro we have pro processes in place on how to evaluate puberty. So for example, right now, I've been doing a lot of telehealth <laughs> during the pandemic. And so I've learned to teach patients how to do self puberty exams at home. Um, I show them Tanner stages or sexual maturity rating stages um, pictures online and walk them through how they could evaluate themselves in the privacy of their home. I also have learned to obtain early morning gonadotropins, luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH as well as the sex steroids, estrogen or testosterone in order to find out if someone might be in puberty and then they, or, and then they could potentially benefit from a medication such as a puberty blocker. So I think it's doable. Um, you know, it's not without its, its problems and it won't be effective for all patients, but it would be helpful to have some guidelines in order to, to plan out how we could accomplish this. I also use the CDC guidelines, um, which are online, um, teaching caregivers how to accurately measure height at home to track linear growth. Um, alternatively, I've um, encouraged patients to have a uh, well child check at their primary care provider office if it's due for that time, and they can get a height and a weight then and then report to me. So it's very important for us to track growth in our patients because uh, the medications that we're prescribing can have an impact on growth. So puberty blocker medications, for example, keep the growth plates open, prolonging the growth period. Um, however, um, sex steroids such as estrogen or testosterone um, can accelerate growth plate closure. So we really want to track growth in our patient population. Um, in addition, patients without adequate home broadband um, are assisted with our social worker or providers or nursing care coordinator to conduct video visits from other locations, such as their primary care clinic or their school health office or other private locations, such as a community LGBT center with broadband um, or other location. This is critical because we don't want telehealth to be available to only a select few who have excellent home broadband. Um, I think long-term, we also need to increase broadband, broadband access throughout the country. Finally, the long-term plan will include continuing education initiatives, such as, a video visit, so, such as a video training providers on how to conduct telehealth history and physicals for transgender youth in particular. 
There are already um, some online videos posted um, guiding providers on how to do it, like a telehealth primary care exam or a telehealth rheumatologic exam. But it would be helpful for us to have a, a video training provider providers on how to um, do history and physicals for this patient population. Here at UCSF, the department, uh, the uh, telehealth uptake actually mirrors the national trends as expected. Overall, the Department of Pediatrics has increased ambulatory visits by 6% from baseline when compared to last year. In pediatric endocrinology in the West Bay, we have maintained a majority of our visits via telehealth and actually increased our overall volume of ambulatory visits by 37%, which I think is just remarkable. Our UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center West Bay data are shown here from, uh, just for your reference, on both figures, the y-axis shows the number of patients seen and the x-axis shows the week number where week minus 10 corresponds to January 2020 prior to the pandemic. Week zero corresponds to mid-March when uh, telehealth was completely uh, adopted and week 32 corresponds to the end of October. Of note, you'll see that there's a significant decrease uh, during weeks 22 to 24 when Meredith was on vacation. On the left figure, each visit type is color-coded with blue representing in-person visits, green representing telehealth visits, and yellow representing procedure visits. The darker blue and darker green colors represent new patient visits. You'll see that there was an abrupt conversion of in-person to telehealth visits at week zero, where the blue really turned all to green. Um, and you'll also note that all procedures were stopped from week zero until week five, which was the uh, end of April. What's important to mention here is that our multidisciplinary approach has continued throughout the pandemic with joint visits for all new patients that include both medical and mental health providers from our team. From April to October, you'll see that there has been an increase in in-person visits, but the majority of visits have remained telehealth. Of the four medical providers at the Child and Adolescent Gender Center, I've been the only in-person medical provider, so the pattern has continued since beyond the weeks that are shown here. And if you look at the data compared to the pre-pandemic weeks, you can see that we have maintained seeing new patients and increased the overall number of patients seen. The figure on the right shows the number of patients who were seen versus not seen. Uh, we were interested to know if there were an increase in no-show appointments when we switched over to telehealth. And you can see that there has not been a significant increase in no-show appointments based on our experience. More analysis of our clinic appointment data will be useful in determining the next steps of our care model and approach. So we are all now looking forward to healthcare practice changes post pandemic. Changes in telehealth policy are needed long term to make video visits feasible for both patients and for providers and UCSF as an organization. In order to further expand telehealth infrastructure, the federal and state governments have grants to increase access for underserved communities such as rural or low socioeconomic areas. And this is critical. Um, we need to advocate for ongoing and increased grant money at the, at the federal and state level for this. There are still many communities right now that don't have access to adequate broadband, and that really limits their access to health, telehealth services, creating what we call the digital divide. In order to further expand telehealth infrastructure, um, uh, the, the federal government and state governments um, will, be, will be increasing grant money um, It's projected over the next four years. Now, there needs to be more equitable insurance coverage for telehealth services across insurance types as well. Um, California had passed already a telehealth parity law in 2019, um, which basically states that um, payers need to reimburse equally for telehealth services as compared to in-person care. Um, and you, California continues to be a leader in telehealth policy. 
So we're lucky in the state of California, but we need to see these changes throughout the nation. Additional regulations must change long-term. For example, patients must be able to access telehealth in the home setting. States should pass compact licensing laws for physicians and nurse practitioners to allow providers to conduct video visits with patients in multiple states and a region. And video visits should be an acceptable way to establish a pre-existing relationship prior to prescribing a controlled substance. I think we have all um, felt the differences. So before the pandemic, if I had a patient, a, a gender diverse patient who was in Nevada, for example, and they couldn't access services near them, um, they would have to drive across the Nevada border into California to access telehealth with me um, because I'm not licensed in the state of Nevada. Whereas if there was a compact license where I could be licensed in multiple states in a region, that would increase access of, of care for our, for our patients. So these, these changes are, are critical and all of us as providers need to be advocating for some of these long-term changes. Finally, um, training on how to provide healthcare using telehealth must be integrated into clinician education. So whether that's medical schools, nurse practitioner schools, pharmacy schools, and all other schools, we really need to integrate um, telehealth training so that providers know how to use this technology effectively to provide quality healthcare. And finally, we also need more research. So we, have, we do have good evidence in a wide variety of populations that telehealth is satisfactory and that it can be quite effective for care. However, we have very little information on cost. Um, so we need to collect that data, um, both cost to organizations who must maintain telehealth infrastructure, as well as cost or savings to patients when they do video visits. Um, and we also need more research on quality in our particular population of transgender youth. Um, so we wanna see outcome data on how um, telehealth can help people um, access gender affirming care and whether that does in fact improve health disparities. The future of telehealth involves not only policy changes but also emerging technologies. A major area of growth is the de development of remote patient monitoring. This can occur when the patient is at home or inpatient under quarantine circumstances. So for example, a home measurement device such as a continuous glucose monitor or CGM can collect data from the patient on blood sugar, transmit it by Bluetooth to a phone or a tablet, which is then transmitted um, to, by Wi-Fi or cellular network to a cloud. The data is then uploaded into a web-based user interface where a healthcare provider can interpret the data and then make changes to the plan of care. There are also home medical kits that enable providers to conduct a physical exam remotely. You can see in the upper right hand corner here, an example of one of those kits. Um, the information that is garnered during the exam using these tools gets automatically uploaded into the electronic med medical record. So th this could be a new a wave of the future. NASA continues to develop new technologies that meet the medical needs of both astronauts, but also people here on Earth. Um, so for example, NASA has developed new portable ultrasound devices that generate clearer pictures inside the human body and then transmit images to remote clinicians for interpretation. The ultrasound machines can direct high intensity focused ultrasound waves to stop internal bleeding without invasive procedures or the ultrasound devices can be used to, to diagnose the rate of bone loss and then use low intensity pulses to heal bone fractures or to increase um, bone development. All of this can be managed remotely by providers. UCSF organization also has several emerging telehealth initiatives. This is very exciting to see. Um, the pandemic has certainly accelerated the implementation of many of this. For example, we are actively working on a, a Zoom integration with Epic. Uh, patients and providers can click a button after logging into the electronic medical record in order to launch a video visit. In addition, patients with hearing loss can now use um, integrated secure live transcription during Zoom visits in which spoken words are converted into text. So this is going to further increase access to care for, for patients. You can see here in the graphic um, an example of how, how the Zoom Epic integration would work. 
a patient would log into my chart, their patient portal. They would click a visit, a button to join a visit, very simple. Um, and then Zoom would notify Epic that the patient has joined. And then the provider logs into Apex, sees the patient has joined the video visit and clicks a button to join the visit themselves. Um, Zoom would then notify Epic that the provider has joined and the two can conduct a successful telehealth visit. In addition, UCSF is implementing more remote patient monitoring. For example, providers can order uh, remote patient blood pressure monitoring. Patients receive a home Bluetooth enabled blood pressure device that transmits data to a smartphone app. The data is then transmitted to UCSF EPIC or APEX and the provider can analyze the results and then adjust care. I encourage all of you to think about how telehealth post pandemic can be used to improve patient care and access to care in your setting. So in summary, uh, we showed that prior to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, telehealth had already showed promise in providing access to quality, satisfactory, and cost-effective healthcare. Our needs assessments reveal that geographic barriers to care limited access to the UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center and that RTGD youth and caregivers express interest in expanded video visit services. This telehealth QI project demonstrated that expanded telehealth at our clinic increased access and access acceptability of care while maintaining excellent communication, privacy, and satisfaction. And while telehealth can't replace in-person clinical care altogether, it can clearly augment care by facil facilitating routine follow-up visits that may not necessarily require a physical exam. And finally, uh, the future of telehealth could be limited by regulatory challenges and the digital divide, but emerging technologies may also transform healthcare. In closing, you know, we want to thank all of the patients and their caregivers for offering their perspectives, not only for the needs assessments, but also during the survey and ongoing as we continue to provide this care. And we also want to, of course, thank everyone at, at the UCSF Child and Adolescent Gender Center who have um, helped to distribute the surveys and to provide input on, on devising the questions that are most important to us. Um, so Dr. Rosenthal, our, our, our medical director, Stanley Vance, um, an adolescent medicine provider, Diane Aronseft and Eric Anderson, our uh, psychologists, our social work, Jay Cohen, um, our nurse coordinator, Julia Bagai, um, and there are others that I think Meredith wants to think as well. Yeah, I just want to say that one of the things this project has really highlighted for me is that um, success requires a team. And it's been just a pleasure working together with people from all different disciplines to put together the successful project. Um, I've learned so much from my colleagues, from our patients, our caregivers. Uh, this project became stronger because of them. Um, I also appreciate the support of the organization. Um, I'm thrilled that UCSF um, has a mission of increasing access to care, uh, promoting health equity. Um, we had the support of administrators. We had the support of the UCSF Telehealth Resource Center, including the director, um, Linda Brannigan, as well as the manager, Patty Mason. So I wanna thank everybody who's involved, not in just the clinical care um, and the development of that project, but just the, the organizational support as, as, as a whole. And here are some resources. Um, these resources are um, for you to learn more about telehealth, uh, telehealth resources. Um, this includes you know, grants, um, information on uh, um, changing regulations, which are you know, getting updates pretty much every month, um, as well as also if you'd like to learn more about the clinical practice guidelines for transgender, gender diverse youth and adults, um, here are some websites you could go to, including our, our Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. And then finally, I would like to close by highlighting some of the quotes that patients and caregivers told me during the project. So while we did distribute the anonymous um, red cap survey to collect information for our outcome measures, 
Um, patients and caregivers did also share some of their feelings with me about telehealth, and I wrote them down anonymously. And these three quotes really hit home for me. Um, they summarized what some themes that I heard from a lot of patients. So, for example, one patient told me, <laughs> the one good thing about the pandemic is that I can do video visits to see my doctor. <laughs> Uh, this actually was said very early on, and I think the person had been doing online school for a while and, um, you know, had been feeling the stress of everything with the pandemic, but was really grateful to be able to connect with our clinic during this whole time and get care. And so I thought that was, that was really important. Um, also, um, someone, a common theme was that telehealth is much more convenient, especially for routine things like going over lab results or dose changes of hormones like estrogen or testosterone. So it made something that needs to happen and is really important for quality care a lot more convenient for people. Um, and then finally, um, I did get feedback about from the, from the family perspective about when telehealth could be great and when in-person care could be better. Um, so um, one, one parent actually told me that it was better to have in-person visits in the beginning um, because making decisions about starting things like puberty blockers or estrogen or testosterone can sometimes be intense as a family. And being able to meet your provider, establish rapport, and have you know, those intense discussions early on can sometimes be incredibly helpful. So we, again, see telehealth as a complement to in-person care. Um, but I think this project shows that um, it can successfully increase access. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for uh, really uh, a great presentation and showing us uh, the great impact of your work here. Um, we have just a couple of minutes um, for questions and there's one on the chat on the Q&A already. So feel free, anyone in the audience, if you have other questions to type them in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Jim Wong actually asked, can you comment on how you see use of telehealth affects your needs or use of, for having multiple locations, San Francisco, Oakland, San Mateo, San Ramon. Yeah, I can, I, I can make a comment that, you know, we are actively discussing as a clinic how we are going to move forward with a, with a hybrid uh, clinic video model. And, um, and, you know, I think it's important to us to have these community centers at other locations, because as we've demonstrated, not everything um, can be done during doing telehealth and not every visit is appropriate um, for families to, to access. So um, likely this won't ever get rid of our, our need or desire to have satellite clinics in the community, but it may be that, um, that we may not have to do as many travel sessions out there and more telehealth um, mm -hmm. where everyone can access care. Great. Yeah, I, I would... I would agree with that. I, I would say that um, I, we envision having um, a hubs in the community. And the way I think of it is like a, a, a web. And so we would have these nodes where we would have satellite clinics that could, where we could do in-person care, maybe for first initial visits or when a patient needs a, a physical exam. And we could help build um, community resources within that region um, and partner with primary care clinics in that region, and then use telehealth to connect all the nodes and to create a, a large web of care. And so that's, that's really the power of doing this hybrid model. Great. Um, one more question here. Were there any informal assessments of patient family acceptability of having students and trainees present during the telehealth business, giving the teaching mission, mission of UCSS? That's a great question and a, and a fantastic suggestion, I think, going forward. So we did not assess that, but we have maintained our ability to have learners in our clinic, in our multidisciplinary clinic, and obviously we always ask if it's okay for them to join. Um, but absolutely, that's a great thing that we can, we can start assessing going forward. Mm -hmm. I, I, one of the things that is important to me is um, patient confidentiality and privacy. And so we did have those aspects in our survey and the reports from the patients themselves um, showed equivalent um, communication and privacy were achieved in both in-person and video visits. However, I hope that in our um, gender clinic um, practice guidelines for telehealth that we can have very specific procedures on best practices. So for example, 
um, making maybe verifying before we begin the visit that the patient is in a secure location. So, um, you know, we have all had the, the experience where someone attempts to, you know, conduct a video visit from an unsecure location where there, someone else could be could overhear what's going on. And so we really need to have procedures in place where we can work with our, our patients and families to make sure that privacy and confidentiality, confidentiality are um, uh, protected. And then in terms of having other learners like in with a visit, just like with in-person visits, we always ask for um, consent and we make sure that it's part of the confidential visit within Zoom, which is has a lot of security features to protect privacy. Great. I think that answers all the questions on the Q&A. Um, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. It's 101. So thank you both very much. I'll hand it over to Dr. Hirsch to uh, close it up for us. Thank you, Sandra. And I want to thank our speakers for a really compelling presentation and our audience for their participation. It really does point us towards the future. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of lessons to be learned broadly uh, for everybody taking care of of patients and children in particular. So thanks again and be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.